Good morning. As you guys might have figured out, this is a no Joe day. So uh, myself and Sam and Dylan are going to be delivering the sermon today in three parts. So uh, we need all the prayer we can get. So if you guys wouldn't mind bowing your heads and uh, opening with prayer here. Dear God, uh, we just ask that your message would come through, that you would work within us and uh, give us the focus and... um, the clarity we need to uh, deliver your message. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, um, yeah, so we're in the season of Advent where we're anticipating, um, in a sense, you know, the the first arrival of Jesus. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, this first candle burning up here, you know, represents hope in, um, and so we thought we would uh, explore that topic a little bit, the topic of hope. And uh, um, hope's kind of a, a funny thing. The way we use the word, we, we tend to use it more almost like a wish. You know, like a man's hope is like I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that Georgia wins over Georgia Tech. You know, is anybody... <laughs> I really don't have time to watch football anymore, so I don't stay up with it. But I happen to be watching that game that went into like eight overtimes and it was like I don't think I've ever seen anything like that that was incredible but yeah our man's hope is usually for something you know you're hoping hoping for rain or hoping for your game your team to win or your um for me I was telling first service that uh for me it's like I'm hoping I don't run out of gas because I'm I'm of the mentality and like I usually push it pretty far my second vehicle that I owned when I was a teenager was a 56 Ford pickup, and it didn't have a gas gauge. And so I developed this system where I would write down the, you know, the miles, I would put it, stick it on my dashboard, and I would try and estimate where I was going to run out. So I got pretty good at running out of gas, you know. <laughs> You'd think I, it would have been the opposite, but no, I just like... Oh, no, I got seven miles left. I'm good. Um, yeah, but that's really different. That kind of hope, you know, I'm hoping I'll make it. You know, I have enough fumes to get to the gas station. That's, that's like we're hoping for something. But hope, when we're thinking in the context of, of uh, being a Christian and being a believer, is so much more. You know, we, we have hope. We have hope because... Christ has already accomplished something for us. And our hope is that we have salvation. We have the hope that, um, that he will one day redeem us and we will be with him forever, which is like, that is crazy if you think about it. I mean, who thinks of stuff like that? If you were, if you were just a mortal man, you know, and, and uh, told somebody they were going to live forever, you know, uh, they would probably think you were trying to sell them some kind of snake oil. But we, we believe in the supernatural. You know, we believe that God has accomplished these things through Christ and that we are going to be with him in eternity. And that that's hope. And uh, so much exceeds the kind of hope we would have just in our wishful thinking. We're going to be looking at um, Luke chapter 1. And I'll be reading from verses 30 through 38. Um, I'll tell you what, if you really want to talk about hope, just read read the whole book of Luke sometime. It is so packed with messages of hope. But in the beginning here, in this part part that we're going to explore, um, the angel Gabriel has appeared before Mary, and he's got a message for her. And starting in verse 30, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So God named him. You know, when we when we say when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not just uh, it's not just a name. It's like God named him. You know, from the beginning. So um, I'm a building contractor, and I and I had a drywall subcontractor whose name was Jesus and uh, and so I had that plugged into my phone and every so often you know my phone would ring and someone would see that you know 
It's like, you better pick that up. <laughs> Jesus is calling you, man. And I don't think he wants to talk about drywall. But um, it goes on to say, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, later on in Luke, you know, you'll find that there were some Israelites who cashed all their hope in this portion about the house of Jacob. You know, they, were, they wanted him to rule over an earthly kingdom. You know, they hadn't really... I mean, even when they went to the grave... Uh, and saw that he was gone, they didn't fully grasp that he had something bigger going on. Um, so he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So this is dealing with that supernatural aspect of, of this promise. You know, nothing, nothing is impossible with God. So, you know, Mary's barren relative Elizabeth uh, conceives and uh, and she's being called to carry uh, a child who will be called the son of God well I want to kind of focus on the next little portion of this and that is Mary's response you know Mary said in verse 38 behold I am a servant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word so you know I would just love to have that, that simplicity reign in my life. And I think, you know, if, um, if you were to ask yourself, you know, the same question, you know, what, what would be my response to if God called me to something, you know, how would I respond? You know, would I respond, you know what? I want to serve the Lord. I'm in. You know, um, let it be according to your word, you know. That's a pretty bold, bold statement. But a little bit later on, uh, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And, um, and you guys, I'm sure many of you have heard this story, how when Mary gets to the door and, and, and announces herself, who knows, you know, it's probably like, hey, you know, I'm here. Um, when, uh, when Elizabeth heard that, her child leapt in her womb, you know, and... Uh, it's cool that God gave Elizabeth to Mary in that sense that they had that, you know, pregnancy to go through together. They were, they were side by side through this thing, through their believing and through their delivering, uh, delivery. And, of course, we know John the Baptist's role was pretty awesome, too. But um, that's something that we have, too. We have each other. We go through these journeys together with one another, and God gives us each other, you know, to strengthen us and take us through these things. But I also love what comes next and what comes out of um, Elizabeth's mouth. She says in verse 45, she says, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken from the Lord. See, that's, that's where we put our faith. We put our faith in God being an, an, a uh, fulfiller of those things that he promises. He promised us that we have eternal life. He promised us salvation. He promised us the cleansing from our sins. We have all that, and just we just have to believe it. We have to out and out just believe in that. We have to believe in, you know, something supernatural. We have to believe that God is not only capable but willing to pull through on these incredible promises that he's given us. So I'm going to be followed by Sam. And um, Sam's coming on up right now. And uh, take her away, Sam. 
I made the joke last, I sat closer this time. Uh, I made the joke last uh, service that my legs are short, so it takes me a while to get up here. Neil was waiting for me. And I, I was told that I'm not allowed to walk around this service, okay? So somebody keep me in my cage right here. Um, first thing I want to show you, I didn't say this last service, but this Bible that I got up here is an FCA coach's Bible. Um, and, and the reason I want to show you this is because it, anybody can see it's a little bit tattered. And, and here's the honest truth. This thing is tattered because I would take this on every single wrestling trip with me for 13 years almost, or whenever my wife gave this to me. And um, I can tell you, and honestly, I didn't open it as much as I should. So it's tattered because it was shoved in bags. <laughs> <clears throat> so just a, just a reminder that I am no Bible scholar. Um, but I do, I just want to say thanks for letting me come up here. Uh, thanks for hanging out, coming to service. And man, it's pretty cool. I got to hang out with Neil and Dylan yesterday and ate some good food at One Street Down. Is that the name of the restaurant? Goodness sakes. If I would have finished my breakfast burrito, I would have been sleeping right there in the chair. Um, and first, I'll just tell you who I am. I, I moved here. My, my wife and kids are over here. I moved here from the Midwest. I grew up in Newburgh, Oregon, also known as the best wrestling city in the entire state of Oregon, uh, just for you people wondering. And... Uh, um, but I graduated from Newburgh High School, I went to Clackamas Community College, wrestled there for two years, and then I, I made the trip out to, did kind of the reverse Oregon Trail and, and went to school right outside of St. Louis, Missouri, um, and spent, man, most of, almost as much time as, as I spent in Oregon, I spent out there. So I lived there for 16 years, from wrestling in college to then coaching and, and kind of moving uh, to a different school here and there to kind of develop that part of my career. And what I can tell you is that I chased a lot of trophies. I chased a lot of, even in my own wrestling career, a lot of fulfillment that I, that I tried to gain from that. And any athletes in here, you can probably, I probably hopefully resonates with you a little bit that chasing those things is a truly empty feeling. Um, I was adopted at a young age, about two weeks old. And so I was raised by a family that is not blood, but is my parents and my brother and sister are amazing amazing people, and, and I struggled with that for a long time, and trying to find hope in a family that I, I never knew. I still don't know to this day, and raising my um, kids and having my wife is, is a beautiful thing because those are the first, my kids are the first blood relatives I've ever had, so that's a powerful thing in my life, and um, a lot of the time I, I was seeking hope in those trophies and not spending time with my, my kids and my wife. Um, and so a quick story before I get into the word, um, and I'm more of a storyteller and a wrestling coach, so I should be up here in sweats and a sweatshirt, like tucked in. That'd probably make me feel more comfortable. But um, the height of COVID, 2021, I was coaching a, a college wrestling team, and uh, I had two girls that made a junior world team. Now that, that junior world championship was going to be in Ufa, Russia, which is, I don't know how far from Moscow, but it's in Russia. So, um, and I spent some time in New York at a training camp and then we flew overseas. Uh, my son over there was nine days old and making that decision. And my wife can tell you that I, I was, I beat myself up about it. You know, I need, that's somewhere I need to be in my home with my wife and our new kid. We had two kids. That was our second kid. And during that time when I was in Russia, uh, I think it was the night before we competed. Um, my son ended up in the hospital. So less than a month old, he was sick, he was coughing, and it was during COVID, so our daughter was not allowed to come with my wife and, and son, and so she had to be watched by one of our coaches, which was a blessing. And um, one of those times, my wife was making the decision to get my son a spinal tap to figure out if he was, had spinal meningitis or any type of sickness, and the profanities that came out of that hotel room that I was in in Russia probably shouldn't be repeated anywhere because I wasn't where I was supposed to be. And I was chasing fulfillment where I shouldn't have been chasing fulfillment. And there's a lot of worse things you can be doing than chasing trophies and medals and that kind of stuff. But for me, it, it, it hurt because I wasn't where I was supposed to be. And I think, you know, we all hope for something. We all, we all walk around this earth hoping for something, the next best thing. If I hope if I get that car that I'll finally be happy. I hope that if I buy that house that I'll finally be happy, which we're buying a house or trying to, 
good luck to us, right, in this economy. Um, but we, we hope for that thing that, that's going to lead us to fulfillment. And so one thing that led me personally to a change in, in our career in careers and also a different path is I was hoping for that fulfillment, fulfillment, but I had lost hope in my daily process. I had lost hope in the day-to-day. I was opening up another season, you know, in, in 2021, that was when I was going, and then and then 2022 start, right? The season, 21, 22 starts. And I was about to start the wrestling season. I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. I'm getting tingles right now. I, I cannot do this anymore. I'm filling myself with things that are never going to fill the void in my life that, that Jesus and God had intended to fill for so, so long. And I hope that hits with somebody here today. Filling our lives with things that we think are important at the time is a big deal. We think it's a big deal, and it really is so insignificant to the greater power of the Lord. And so I, I look at this, this verse, and going back to verse 29 in Luke, when Gabriel comes down and is telling Mary, like, hey, this is what the kingdom of God needs from you. We need you to carry this baby. He's going to be the savior of the world, and he's going to bring hope to many, many people. And in that moment, if it, it says in 29, if I can find it, but she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Have we ever gotten news that we're like, what's this? Right? I hated those texts from athletes that was like, I need to talk to you. About what? <laughs> Tell me now so I can kind of mentally prepare for what we're going to talk about. Are you quitting the team? Are you not going to make weight this weekend? Like, what's the deal? Right? So she's getting this news, and she's like, okay, what, what's this going to be about? And then Gabriel tells her what the, what the plan is, what's going on. And at the very end, in 38, she said, and I I said in first service, I'm not going to keep this PC, okay? I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. She submitted. She was like, what are we going to talk about? And then Gabriel explained, and then she submitted to the plan the Lord had for her, but also for us today that we can submit and follow Jesus and keep moving forward with our lives and and try to fulfill ourselves with the things the Lord has intended for us, not the worldly things that we try to fill ourselves with all the time. And I tell that to kids that I coach a lot. Well, not as much anymore. I've kind of, I tried to retire and got pulled out of retirement a little bit. Um, But we, we talked about at the beginning of the year, submitting to the plan that I as a coach had for them for many, many years. I wrestled from when I was six years old. And I had learned and and developed even as a coach, like, hey, this is what works to get you to the promised land, right? I want to stand on top of the podium. This is how you get there. And I would tell kids all the time, hey, don't just dip your toe in. Jump into the pool. Jump in and submit and just listen. And, And it'll lead you to where you want to be, I promise you. And I feel like Mary was kind of put in that situation, like, hey, submit, and let's do this. Let's change the world. And I don't know, ladies in here, I haven't birthed a child, but I know my wife has. Um, It's not an easy thing to do. Okay? (laughs) Carry a baby for nine months and then push it out? That's tough. That's painful. It's a hard decision to make. And, and as an athlete, it was a hard decision to make. And let me, let me throw this picture up here for you. I, I enjoy doing hard things now that I've learned that over the years. And this was one of my, my things that, like, makes me feel. This is, I call this Power Ranger season. So as cold as it gets, I still try to run outside because you got to make the choice to just do something nobody else is doing. And guess what? In today's world, how many people are trying to follow Jesus? Not as many as it should be. Choose to make the decision, like, I got to do the hard things. I got to do things that will sharpen me and develop me into who I want to be. And that's a never-ending process for a lot of us. It's, I, going back to the story of us coming back here, I, I was standing at the national tournament, and our, our team had just won our third national title in a row, and I was standing on the far side of the gym, and I'm getting goosebumps again. 
I, we were, I was standing on the far side of the gym, and the team's getting trophies over here, and the girls are getting their, oh, wrestler of the year, and all this stuff, and I'm just standing there empty, completely empty. Like, this means nothing in the grand scheme of things. And it was at that moment I knew, also, you know, my son being sick and my wife being there by, my, by herself, and then that moment I knew that something had to change. And making the decision to walk away from what I was doing, the, I was on the gravy train with biscuit wheels, like, this is easy. I get to coach college wrestling, and people actually have to go to work for a living. And I chose, and we chose, to make the hard decision to move out here with no plan, no job. But God, had, God was screaming at me, like, dude, you got to stop. And sorry, I use high school, and I teach high school now, so I use high school language like, dude, dude, you got to stop. You've got to change your path. You will not be fulfilled. You can win all you want, and you will never fill the void. Stop. And, it, and then that leads me to Romans 5. And sorry, the Bible scholar me. And just so you guys know, I'm the guy that has to look in the front of the Bible to know where the, <laughs> where the book is. So any of you out there are like, man, this guy really knows what he's talking about. No. Okay. So... In Romans 5, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Also through him, we have obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And through this time, talking to Neil and talking to Dylan, this came to me. I, I had searched anywhere I could find some, some insight. And this verse came to me and it just smacked me. How many times, anybody, God smacks you in the face every once in a while? This one smacked me in the face. But it really helped me to realize, like, that's what was going on. I needed a change. I needed to seek the Lord. I needed to be around my family and my kids and be with them. And I'm still terrible at it. But the process isn't done. The process of fulfilling my life with the right things isn't done. And it's not going to be done until, you know, they throw me six feet under, okay? But I, my challenge to you, and this is another piece to this, my challenge to you is that if you're seeking hope, if you're seeking something, a lot of people come through these doors of this church seeking hope, seeking fulfillment. And us as Christians, if you've found that and struggle in your life, you know that they're going to make it through because you have. You got to deal it to them. You got to give them that hope. Be that reassuring thought, that reassuring hug, that reassuring handshake, that look in the eye like, hey, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. And I told that to my wrestlers all the time. The joke was that well, I, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose. And I said, yeah, you're right. If you lose, the sun is not going to come up tomorrow. The world will stop spinning. And you might even die just right where you're at when you lose. <laughs> then the joke was that, like, dude, we're going to mess up. We go through things. And, and if you haven't, you will. And the people who have, you should be dealing some hope to people. And I think... And I said this, and I got a little chuckle, and it's, it's real. Like, I think we as people, we look to the wrong dealer sometimes. We're looking to a TV show. Or some people, they're looking to the dealer that gives them things that's not going to help them. And we need to be hope dealers as Christians. We need to be handing out hope to everybody everywhere we go. Because the world is hard. It's tough. And it's hard to be fulfilled. And I think that if we can continue to work on our faith and build our faith and and build our hope in this world, I think we can give that to other people. So I hope that some of this resonates with you. I'm going to give you, leave you with one thing, and my challenge is to you is to just continue to try to provide hope for people. But don't lose hope because it's hard. Find beauty in the struggle. Hope that you will be molded into an instrument of hope for someone else. And I think that, that needs to be our prayer constantly, that we're constantly just being molded into somebody and, and people that can that can provide hope for others, especially in this season. It's a tough season for some. It is. Christmas is tough for some. They've lost family members and, and all sorts of stuff. 
and we need to be that. And especially this church, we need to be a, a place of hope for others. So um, I'll let Dylan come up here. I, I got to correct myself from last time. This, this is the second time I've seen Dylan with pants on, okay? <laughs> it's because he wears shorts that I see him. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Man, that was awesome. Um, let me set this up real quick. Not too good with technology. I'm not even using my microphone. I don't like microphones too much either, but I like my flashcards, my notebooks, and here we go. So um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to everyone, everyone being here today and um, to everyone making breakfast, the worship team, um, Joe and Lila, and just everyone here, and especially God for kind of helping us and giving us words to speak um, today, and it's it's not us speaking right now, and I kind of realized that when I thought I kind of knew what I was going to be talking about today, and kind of had my whole thing kind of maybe planned out, and then God was like, nope, you're not saying that, don't even try, and I have something else for you, so I wrote it all down, so I'm kind of reading from that notebook today for you guys, but kind of the first thing I just wanted to start off with was, um, with this theme of hope, is reading a passage from Luke chapter 1, verse 37 to 38, where it says, uh, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So with that, um, Mary, didn't, Mary didn't question what was going on. She, she wasn't asking why. She, she was ready to go. She was ready for what was to come. And there's a lot of unknown for her as well, but she, she was ready. She, um, her strength, her faithfulness, and her hope was unmatched in this situation. The difference between wishful hoping and having eternal hope tethered by God is kind of what this is talking about. Switching that mind, mindset from that wishful hope and, and um, to a more eternal hope is where that strength and faith can grow. So... And that strength and faith kind of leads me to um, what I was saying before of my whole kind of talk being um, God let me know what was actually going on. And we were talking sermon planning, and I had my thing, and then I was kind of like, man, I'm not sure. And then I was driving back home from work one day. My good friend Josh, who's actually he's a part of this church as well, he, um, he called me, and we were just kind of catching up and talking, and we were like, hey, we should like start meeting kind of weekly and just catching up with each other. And... Um, so he was just, we were just talking, and he was like, yeah, man, I've actually been, like, reading this book. I was like, man, I didn't know you read books. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> so he was, um, I was like, what's the, what's the title of the book? And he said, um, the title is Unshakable Hope. And right then I just started laughing. I was like, okay, God, I got you now. Like, this is what we're going to be talking about. And Josh was awesome. He actually brought the book to me that next morning, so I was able to kind of read it as much as I could, kind of leading up to this today. And... Um, one of the biggest things from that book, Unshakable Hope, that I kind of um, took from it was in Hebrews um, 6, chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Here are my flashcards falling. Um, it says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever, after the order of the Melchizedek. So with that, kind of what stood out to me again was just the words of soul and anchor. Because I remember kind of going to the river back in the day as a kid with my, with my family, and we'd have our boat and our, our, send our anchor down to the sand. It would be pretty strong. Our boat was staying where we wanted to. But eventually, from either the water rising or lowering and the sand moving around, the anchor would kind of come up, the boat would start floating away, my dad had to go swim at it, go get it, pull it back, and get it back for us. But it kind of just made me think that anchors do have a job to do, but the anchor that we're talking about today is something different. It's stronger. And, and our soul needs that anchor. Um, it's a hooking point that is going to be sturdier than the storm. Our anchor, that rope, is attached to Christ, who has entered on our behalf through Mary. And that rope will never break because it is attached to the Lord and under the care of Christ. And since no one can take your Christ, no one will ever ever be able to take your hope. And, oh, come on. Um, 
But as we all know, life is hard, and it will test what we are anchored to, and if our faith is in the correct things. And this kind of makes me think of the story when my wife and I were first kind of dating. Um, we were driving down the road, and in just a super lighthearted conversation, she brings up, she goes, what do you think you would do if you were Abraham in the whole Abraham and Isaac situation? And I was like, wow. I was like, that's pretty, that's pretty deep and a big conversation to have. I don't even think I know your middle name yet. But she was just like, she, was, she's, she doesn't like small talk. She was, she was wanting to see where my faith was at, where my strength was at. But it really just made me start, the wheels started turning. I started thinking, I was like, there's a huge difference between what we can do and think that we could do under our own strength and what we can do with the strength of the Lord behind us. So, which kind of made me think about Proverbs 3, 5, um, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean onto your own understanding. Not leaning on our own understanding as humans is so hard since we do have a soul, and we care for and love so hard on people and each other. The... um, the why to us means a lot, but there are just things in life that we may never be able to comprehend. And God willing, no one will ever have to go through a test of faith like that of Abraham um, again. However, for any tough situation, we must ask ourselves this question, is what I'm hooked to stronger than what I'll go through? And I'll say that one more time. Is what I'm hooked to stronger than what I'll go through? Everyone is hooked or anchored to something, whether that's a resume, a, a person, a, uh, a retirement account. But these are all surface objects when anchored to things of this world, that's where hope may slip. And the Apostle Paul once proclaimed, he said, we have put our hope in the living God. That's where our hope lies. And by putting our hope in this living God, we are anchoring our hope into God's promise, which nothing is stronger than. And God's promises, they're, they're unbreakable. And with that, our hope is unshakable. And God is not just a promise maker. He, he's of his word. He's a, he's a promise keeper. And the birth of Jesus wasn't just a, a moment of hope for Mary in the story of Luke. It was a fulfillment of promises that God had made for generations God's promise in Jesus was not just for Mary, but it was for the whole world. Through Jesus, in those promises, we're promised forgiveness, redemption, and eternal life. And God is faithful to his promises. The coming of Christ reminds us that no matter how dark the night, the morning will come, and with it the light of hope. And to close out on this idea of the light of hope shining through us, I just wanted to tell a quick story of um, someone named Nick Herman. He, um, he was like a brother to my wife growing up, and um, he was the best friend of my brother-in-law, and he was just really a, he was a part of their family. And he, he, he got cancer early on in high school, and he was, he was a basketball player who was told he'd never be able to play basketball again, and he pretty much just said, he said, okay, bet, here we go. I'm going to play basketball again. And he just, he, he got to work. And with that, he, he just kept working and going and going and going until he made it back to playing basketball. And by his senior year, he was one of the best basketball players in San Diego. And in the open division CIF championship for San Diego, he actually hit a 30-foot three-point buzzer beater to win the game for his team um, with 30 points for a 63-60 to 60 victory. And after the game, he was just, um, just thanking, thanking the Lord and thanking him for everything that he has done. And after that, he kind of met his, his kind of like his dream of being able to play and get a scholarship to go play D1 basketball in college. But after that, he, uh, the cancer did come back. And God, God decided that it was his time to come home and he went, he went back home to God. But um, this sto- the story of, of Nick Herman lives on because to this day I've, I've never been able to give my wife an answer for why, why something like that would happen. And kind of like Mary, the, 
know she didn't ask why, but we all want to know sometimes why. But um, the, life, the life that Nick had, that it lives on in the stories about him and that are, he's talked about every day. And Jesus is, is no doubt the hope of this world, but, but Nick lived a life that was meant to deliver that godly hope to others that he would encounter. And his hope was so strong, strong personally, that it, it spilled out over to others. And that, that was his job. It, it wasn't basketball. That, that was his job. And it brought countless people that were around him then and now to Christ, including myself. And he just, to keep fighting, having faith, and unshakable hope in all things is what he left behind for us. And I even still wear, wear the bracelet today on it that has his name on it. And um, on the underside, it, it has the verse um, of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So every day I looked at this brace, I think of him, and that keeps me going. His, his soul's alive, and, he's, and God's using him still. So through the hard times, just as the good, and the tragedies, just as the fortunate times that we have, we must continue building our lives on these promises of God to keep this unshakable hope going forever. I'll, cl I'll close out in prayer. Dear Lord, I just wanted to thank you so much for bringing us all here together today to realize that hope is not something that comes and goes and it's not something that we lose when we, we tether it to God and we know that our hope is in him and the promises that he gives us when we are faithful to him, that hope is going to be unshakable forever. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.